Good morning, all, and welcome. And thank you all for joining us today for the launch of the Centre for Sex and Gender Equity in Health and Medicine. You can see I've got that off the top of my tip of my tongue, so to speak. My name is Robin Norton. I'm the founding director of the George Institute for Global Health, professor of public health at University of New South Wales, Sydney, and I have the privilege of being the chair of the Interim Steering Committee for the centre, the new Centre for Sex and Gender Equity in Health and Medicine. Before we formally start today's proceedings, just some housekeeping. For those who weren't here yesterday, bathrooms down the stairs to the right and then to the right. Um, and we, we spoke yesterday about emergency exits and we think you just have to go down the stairs or go out those doors if there happens to be a fire. So this event today is being recorded and filmed. Please be aware of this as you move about the room. And this room is also connected with a hearing loop and there is live closed captioning on the screen in front of the stage just over there. So it is now my great pleasure to invite Auntie Lola Ryan to deliver the welcome to country. She did a fantastic job yesterday and really appreciate you being here again today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Nagambi Nagan Anilola, Nai Daru Gulli, La Farouz, Nai Nala Narain, Nala Manang, Vidigal, Nai Gamma Maringai Daru Langa. Welcome, my name is Anilola and I'm a Daru Elder from La Farouz. And I acknowledge we are gathered on the land of the Vidigal people. I introduce myself in our Daru language. Our Daru language is being through much research is being brought back to our community. Uh, our language was lost because we were, our people were put on Aboriginal reserves, so the language now is being taught in our schools, preschools and daycare centres. And I'm excited that um, my grandchildren are learning the language. Uh, I'll have to learn it myself at my age because uh, as they're growing up, they'll probably try and talk to me in language and I won't understand the word they're saying, so they'll probably tell me off in language. No, I don't think they would, they're only eight and five. <laughs> so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all of you present here today. It's really a pleasure to be here again today to welcome you all to the Centre for Sex and Gender equity in health and medicine. I work as an Aboriginal health worker. I work for Child and Family Health in its position I've held for 20 years, very passionate about uh, good health for our children to grow up, become strong adults. Uh, we do have um, quite a few families that are the same sex parents. So, um, and I find that's lovely, we've got a a uh, male couple that um, are rearing three foster children and they're just amazing children and the great job that they are doing with them. So it's really a great thing to, to include them, no matter what sex or gender, everybody's equal to me. I just, find, I just take people as, I, as they come, you know, if they're rude to me, I'm not rude back to them, but I just let them know um, I think they've been a little bit rude. <laughs> so I welcome to country was traditionally done through song, dance, music. Um, that was to welcome all people to the land and to let other tribes know that um, because there are so many different language groups in Australia, they would let them know through those interpretations where there's food and um, fresh water is that, and many ceremonies when they gather together, hundreds of tribes would sometimes gather together, and um, that was so that there was no incest in Aboriginal Australia. So, you know, you married into other tribes that, that were part of your skin group. So, um, yeah because you can't all marry them 
the same people in the same community, you know. It's not good. And um, we always thank our ancestors for taking care of our land, our oceans and our waterways. Hence why we live in such a beautiful country and how our people have survived for 65,000 years. They only took what they needed to survive uh, and that was so that no families went hungry. So today we welcome you in a contemporary way and we ask that you respect the land, the culture and the traditions. Our people walked the land from Sydney Harbour to the Shoalhaven region as they, uh, as, um, you know, they did that seasonally so that they did have the food and to rejuvenate. So on behalf of my ancestors and my community, I will wish you all a very warm welcome. We are spiritual people. We believe our ancestors walk with us. May their spirits be with you, keep you safe wherever your journeys may take you to or from. Bujuri, Nandavabi, and that means thank you. Have a great day. Go go work now. Thank you very much, uh, Auntie Lola, for delivering such a beautiful welcome to country this morning. And I would also like to begin my opening remarks by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, the Bedigal people, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I would also like to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have joined us today. Before we start with today's formal proceedings, we are very grateful to the Honourable Jed Kearney, Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care, to have recorded a video message highlighting the importance of the Centre for the Government. So let's take a few minutes to listen to Minister Kearney. Hello, everybody. I'm recording this message on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Nandri peoples. I offer my respect to elders past and present and I extend that respect to any First Nations people with you at the opening of the Centre for Sex and Gender Equity today. I'd like to thank everyone at the George Institute for Global Health for organising this important event. And can I particularly acknowledge the wonderful Professor Robin Norton, the founding director of this new centre and a fellow member of the National Women's Health Advisory Council. The launch of the Centre for Sex and Gender Equity in Health and Medicine represents a large step forward in fighting what I call medical misogyny. It comes at a time when we are finally beginning a major course correction, righting the wrongs of the past when it comes to gender bias in the health system. While no area of the health and medical world is immune, we know that in so many ways this bias begins with research. Historically, the male body has been the default area of study, the default patient or default man. Any deviation from the male body has been seen as abnormal. Even Aristotle characterised the female body as a mutilated man. Medical research is such an important field for understanding the health of our society and finding the cures and treatment for diseases and health issues for future generations. But the research industry's focus on the male patient has had detrimental effects for women and anyone else who doesn't fit the default patients. That is pretty much a 50-year-old, white, heterosexual man from Pennsylvania. Collecting research data from men and generalising to the female health experience has resulted in poorer health outcomes, increased health costs and negative social impacts for women. Indeed, ignoring sex and gender differences across the research life cycle, from grant submissions through to clinical translation, can even compromise the accuracy of medical science itself. So it's why I'm so excited about the new centre. The undeniable good this centre will do through life-saving research, addressing these inequities will be felt right throughout Australia and indeed the world, bringing together evidence to address significant health issues that result from sex and gender not being properly addressed in the health and medical research and healthcare. And let me tell you, Labor shares your objectives. We're maximising the impact of our health and medical research investments to address this bias. We've announced major reforms to the way the NHMRC awards investigator grants, so they are distributed equally to women and men. 
Late last year, I also launched consultation on the draft statement on sex, gender, variations of sex characteristics, and sexual orientation in health and medical research. Now, this statement will guide health and medical research to ensure that sex and gender are considered in this research, including the variables that need to be understood amongst the LGBTIQA plus communities. It means we can improve knowledge in gaps related to groups that have been historically underrepresented in research. It means that there will be no excuse for generalising research findings from men onto women and LGBTIQA plus people. All of this builds on the work we are doing to develop Australia's first 10 year national action plan for the health and well-being of LGBTIQA plus people and the work of the National Women's Health Advisory Council to address gender bias in the health system. I know many people here today have been involved in all of this work and I know you will all continue working on our shared goal. This new centre will be another step to reaching those goals. So a very hearty congratulations to everyone involved. I really look forward to seeing the excellent work to come for this centre. Thank you. So on to the formal uh, proceeding now. Welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Séverine Lamont. I'm an associate professor and researcher in muscle physiology at Deakin University in Melbourne. And I'd like to wholeheartedly welcome all of you to the second day of this event and to, to, to thank each of you individually for being here. As the incoming co-lead of the Melbourne site of the centre, I am both very happy and humbled to deliver the opening remarks for the launch today. The first thing I'd like to mention is how much work and enthusiasm have been necessary from a large, diverse and globally outstanding team of people to put this event together. So yesterday has already delivered uh, beyond expectations and this would not have been possible without the support of our collaborative partners, the Australian Association of Medical Research Institutes and the Victorian Department of Health and Women's Agenda, as well as our event sponsor, the New South Wales Government. Thank you very much. What pleases me most about all of you here in the audience today is how diverse of a community we are. I am a fundamental researcher who might have elected to never speak to anyone outside of my lab. <laughs> Many of my colleagues are maybe more gregarious public health researchers. Some of you are clinicians. Some of you are advocates. Some of you are, passion, are patients. Some represent spe specific sex or gender minorities, and some of you are politicians. What brings us together today is the urgent feeling that not enough is being done to achieve sex and, sex and gender equity in health and medical research, and therefore to achieve equity in health in general. I was an undergraduate student in the early 2000s, and I remember being told by a physiology professor that physiology research could not afford to care about female or women because they were too hard to study, full stop. And then he moved on and continued with his lecture. So 22 year old me may have found this statement a bit odd and actually it was probably odd enough to, for me to remember it to this day. But I can assure you that 42 year old me would have stood up in the middle of the lecture theater and left the room and probably made a complaint to the dean the day after. That's the type of student I was. So what happened during these 20 years? Well, personally, I became a researcher, and I understood that such definitive answers were only there to be questioned. And when I started to question, I realized that, and maybe to my great surprise, others had been asking the same questions before I was even born. And in fact, some people had, in at, had been at it for 30 years of more. Many of them you have and will hear and learn from yesterday and today. So these people included Robin Norton and uh, Mark Woodward, as well as Rachel Huxley, who is my boss, but also a very busy executive dean and sends us her apologies for today. And this is the people I have the pleasure to represent today. These people are the reason why we are here together in this room in 2024, not in 2044. I also realized that the issue we were tackling as a group was much larger than my little study and research niche. In fact, 
the issue was broader than anything I could imagine and influenced every aspect of research, implementation, and practice. In the last two decades, however, researchers, practitioners, politicians, patients, and the general public started to raise awareness around the massive sex and gender inequities that still exist in health and medical research in our country and globally. The difference is that nowadays, members from the general public know that women suffering from cardiovascular disease are undertreated when compared to men. They have started to have an understanding that the experience of women admitted to hospital with symptoms of heart failure, as an example, are different from that of men represent, presenting with the same symptoms, and that this leads to worse outcomes for them. The result is that, as a society, we now understand that this needs to change. Luckily, in the last 20 years, some have led the way at the organizational and the national level. Other countries, especially North American countries, showed us that there was a path forward. So did you know that if you're a researcher in the US, you basically cannot be awarded government funding for your research if you do not explicitly study your issue of interest across sexes or genders? How good is that? We are fortunate to be able to learn from the very best. And yesterday, many of you had already the opportunity to hear from Professor Cara Tannenbaum, who had been leading the change in Canada for the last two decades, and we are extremely grateful to her for accepting to share her wisdom with us. Cara is just one of the numerous wonderful individuals I have met through this journey. But it is teamwork that makes great work, and we cannot progress without the involvement of those who make and implement policies and guidelines. Over the last year, significant changes have started to happen in Australia, visible changes. A year or so ago, the NHMRC and MRFF have picked government funding bodies for health and medical research, as well as the Australian Association of Medical Research Institutes came to the party. We sat down and drafted statements around how research should be conducted in a sex and gender equitable way in this country. With our continuous energy and advocacy, these efforts will soon, with, will soon lead to prescriptive policies, as in the case in other countries, and make the consideration of sex and gender in health and medical research become the norm rather than an aspiration. I am deeply convinced that we can do great things when we work together towards a common goal, and this is exactly why we are here today. During the day, take the time to hear and learn from and exchange with those you would usually not interact with in your daily work, and think big picture. This is a brand new chapter. We are given the opportunity to write here in Australia. How often do we find ourselves in a situation where we actually have the possibility to do this? Let's dare to be aspirational first, that is today, as there will be plenty of time for practical considerations later in the process. And speaking of aspirational, I could not be given a better opportunity to now introduce our keynote speaker. Padma Raman is Executive Director of the Office Woman at the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. You can read her full bio um, in your booklet, but I've picked up a few interesting facts. Uh, prior, to, prior to joining the Office for Women in 2023, she was the Chief Executive Officer of Australian's National Research Organization for Women's Safety Limited from 2021. And in her time in this job, she established this um, organism as the widely recognized leading authoritative voice on evidence to end violence against women and children. And before starting that, she was the chief executive of the Australian Human Rights Commission for 11 years. So saying that she comes with a wealth of experience as a senior executive at both the state and federal level is an understatement. And we are very grateful to hear from you, Padma, today. Thank you very much. Thank you, I hate those bios. <laughs> um, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're on Bidigal country um, that and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my deep respects to elders past and present. As a, and I wanted to thank um, Auntie Lola in particular. As a migrant woman, I find the welcome to country such an amazingly generous act to welcome people, regardless of who we are, to their country and only beseech us to tread lightly 
I think is an incredibly generous and gracious thing to do, especially given the lands were never ceded. So thank you, I know she's left, but it, uh, I, it always moves me. So I've been the executive director of the Office for Women for six months, I'm very new. Um, this is a newly created, unprecedented, newly created position that's at a much senior level, which basically set, um, goes to the commitment that this government has to put gender at the heart of all decision making. Uh, this government has introduced a range of initiatives, including gender responsive budgeting, which basically means that every policy proposal, every decision that government makes has to consider the gender impacts. And by saying the gender impacts, I don't just mean the impacts on women, I mean the impacts on all genders. Gender bias in the medical system is widespread. It plays out at different levels and continues to have negative impacts on women's health and well-being across the spectrum of research, diagnosis, treatment, and health outcomes. It can lead to issues like delayed diagnosis and misdiagnosis, or women simply not being believed and not receiving the health care they deserve. <coughs> Excuse me, I've, I've just got off a plane, so I'm a bit croaky. Misdiagnosis and delayed diagnosis may be due to sex differences in symptoms, for example, in heart disease, lung cancer and autism, coupled with gender bias in diagnostic approaches and treatment. Clinical trials, basic and translation, tr translational med biomedical research have historically not appropriately considered or have underrepresented and even excluded women, even in studies on female prevalent diseases. This has resulted in treatments being offered to women based on research results of men, as the minister said. However, women and men may respond differently to treatment. For example, cardiovascular disease. I feel like all of you know all of these things. So I might move to um, what is this government doing to respond to some of the things that we all know in terms of bias in the health system. This government is, as you heard from the minister, very enthusiastic minister um, and very passionate about this area. She, I've heard her talk about this in many, many um, fora and I think her background as a nurse really helps understand the bias that, that exists in the health system. So um, on the eve of International Women's Day, um, on March the 7th, the, our minister, Minister Gallagher, who's the Minister for Women, uh, but also the Minister for Finance, the Minister for the Public Service, and the Minister for Data. I'll come back to why that's important in a second. She released um, the first ever national strategy for gender equality. It's called Working for Women, and I've got a copy of it that I should have brought up as a prop, but I, I will circulate if you, if you would like to look at it. It is, um, it is a document that sets out what the government's ambitions are in terms of gender equality, but also recognises that gender equality can't be achieved just by governments, and it requires a whole of community um, response. It, however, it does commit the government to action both now and in future to achieve gender equality. One of the fundamental drivers of the document is an understanding that gender equality or inequality is shaped by stereotypes and gender norms that we have across our society. And Australia is particularly rigid in terms of our gender norms and stereotypes. It also recognises that we won't achieve gender equality unless we work on five priority areas which are all interconnected. And the five areas are ending violence against women, secondly, dealing with unpaid and paid care, thirdly, women's economic security, fourthly, women's health, and finally, women's place in um, decision-making, representation and leadership. And while I know this conference is about gender and um, sex in, in health and medicine, and health is a priority area, the strategy recognises that all of those things are interconnected. We can't have gender equality when women are, when there's violence against women and at the rates, uh, the epidemic rates that we have in Australia. 
And when you think about violence against women, it links to their health outcomes. So women's economic place in society links to how much unpaid and paid care they do, links to the fact that they might experience violence, links to their health outcomes, and therefore links also to their place in society. So the strategy recognises that all of these things have to be worked on if we want to have a gender equal Australia. I've just come back from the Commission on the Status for Women in the UN um, in New York. And one of the really, um, one of the confronting things is to see where women's rights are um, globally. And women's rights are regressing, especially around sexual and reproductive health. And being in the US, that's, that's um, a clear reminder of where things are at and why we need to keep vigilant. And I think research is, is fundamental to, to ensuring that we don't lose sight of, of where those rights are and how they're being treated. So going back to the strategy, the strategy is a 10-year strategy which has a vision for how we might get to um, what, how we might get to gender equality. And one of the things that I noticed while being away is that the gender equality project has consequences. So one of the things that we've witnessed across the world is where we have more gender equal countries, um, like Scandinavian countries, for example, we're seeing an increase in violence against women. So the gender equality project, in terms of what it does in, in terms of men's place in society, has consequences, and we need to keep that in mind even when we're thinking about health research. The government is going to measure progress against the strategy. Um, there's outcomes uh, under the strategy and measurement, and measurement framework, and we'll report on this annually on International Women's Day through a scorecard. Um, so you will see how we're travelling around health outcomes in that scorecard on a yearly basis. Where applicable, the ambitions um, of the strategy and outcomes align with the National Women's Health Strategy and the National Men's Health Strategy. As you probably have heard, the Women's Health Strategy outlines a national approach to improving health outcomes for all women and girls throughout their lives, particularly those at greatest risk of poor health. One of the strategy's key objectives is to strengthen gender equality equity in the health system, including using a gender equity lens and evidence-based approach to combat biases related to sex and gender in the health system. As the Minister said, she's very proud of the Women's Advisory, Women's Health Advisory Council, um, which addresses gender bias in the health system and guides the implementation of the Women's Health Strategy. The Council established subcommittees to look at gender bias in the health system across the areas of safety, research, empowerment, and access, care, and outcomes. The Council conducted the End Gender, Bi End Gen End Gender Bias Survey, which closed on um, October 2023. More than 2,800 responses were received to the survey, which asked women, healthcare professionals, and peak stakeholder groups to share their experiences about gender bias in the health system. The survey found that two-thirds of respondents reported they experienced healthcare-related gender bias or discrimination themselves, and almost 80% of caregivers reported that a person they cared for had similar experiences. Consistent themes, and again, I feel like you would know this, included feeling dismissed and disbelieved, being stereotyped as hysterical and a drama queen, and women's symptoms being readily attributed to other causes, such as menstruation, lifestyle factors, or even faking it. The National Women's Health Summit, which was held last week, I think, and I was very sorry to have missed it, um, furthers the work of the Advisory Council and was attended by consumers, healthcare workers, women's health advocates and experts, and I'm sure a lot of you in the room might have attended it. The summit focused on reducing gender bias in the health system, women's advocacy and decision-making in healthcare, improving access to healthcare and outcomes for women, ensuring an equity approach in the health system. Key themes that emerged were the importance of the health system in addressing and considering intersectionality, the value of multidisciplinary clinical and research teams, the need for community-led interventions to increase the availability of culturally safe services, recognising practitioners' need 
to spend time with patients to build relationships and to deliver the best care, and obviously the locational and cost barriers to care. Again, coming back from America, um, that one of those one of our delegation happened to have a health issue, and the cost of healthcare in the states reminds us of how lucky we are to at least have a universal healthcare system. But much still needs to be done to address the bias in in healthcare research. So we at the Office for Women have been around for 50 years. It's our 50th anniversary this year. And in that time, we've worked under several ministers, assistant ministers, but most importantly, with women across the board, women's, the women's sector, individual women, organizations, allies, with a shared commitment to gender equality. But this work continues as urgently as ever. And as I was saying to you before, um, I think we need to be eternally vigilant because what we are seeing is a backlash. What we are seeing is women's rights regressing across the world. And whether it's in the field of research or whether it's in the field of receiving healthcare, we need to keep, um, we need to keep the rights of women at the forefront, recognizing that the gains we've made are very easy, very, very easily lost and are constantly under challenge. So I thank you for your time and thank you for listening to my slightly jet lag presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Padma, for your slightly jet lagged, which didn't feel like jet lagged at all to me, presentation. Um, moving on, we will now welcome our next speaker who basically will talk about the same thing from a completely different angle. So it is my pleasure to introduce Jen O'Neill. So Jen is a social worker and a mom of two young boys who resides on the central coast here in New South Wales. At the age of 36, Jen suffered her first spontaneous coronary artery dissection, heart attack, and has since survived two more. Because of her lived experience, Jen is passionate about heart awareness and advocacy with a particular focus on the limited understanding, education, research and intervention with women who do not fit the typical heart patient precursors. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to start to by acknowledging the lands on which we meet today and the traditional custodians. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Well, I'm thrilled to be here today to, at this centre launch to share my experience. Uh, and sincere thanks to the organisers for inviting me. My story may sound rare, but I believe it is more common than first thought. And I'm hoping that my story will show the essential need for sex and gender consideration in health and research. In 2016, when I was 36, I had my first heart attack, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or SCAD as it's otherwise known. Um, I had a toddler at the time and I was breastfeeding a baby have no risk factors or precursors that could have indicated that this may happen, including no uh, family history of heart disease. For those who aren't aware of SCAD, it's, it's an uncommon heart attack that happens um, when a tear forms in one of the blood vessels in the heart, and it's the number one cause of heart attacks in women under 50. The major challenge in diagnosing SCAD um, is getting the healthcare pr practitioners to look beyond the seemingly young and healthy individual. So that day, back to the day in 2016, was a bit of a stressful day and I had, I was telling my husband about it and all of a sudden I got this discomfort that went down my arm um, and also in my left breast. I felt extremely nauseous. Um, I thought, straight away, oh, maybe this is mastitis, which I'd never had. I, I dismissed my symptoms completely. Thankfully, my husband didn't. He forced me to go to hospital. I did refuse an ambulance. I didn't want to take away from a precious community um, resource, so those might need more than me. Um, when I got to the hospital, the medical team were confident, as was I, that this was simply stress or a panic attack. When it came, my results came back that my troponin levels had been risen, it stunned everybody and most of all me. Thankfully, they insisted on have me having a traditional angiogram before I could get 
um, discharge, just to double check. I was so I had to wait for an angiogram and I kept getting uh, bumped further and further down the list as more urgent cases presented into ED and a few days went past. This, you can imagine, was quite upsetting for me. I needed to get home to my breastfed baby uh, and toddler and my toddler had only just been diagnosed with autism so we had a lot going on. I remember sitting in a busy open ICU ward which was dominated by male patients with a breast pump asking for an angiogram so I could go ahead and get home to my babies. I um, asked to be transferred to the local private hospital and was able to get an NGO within the day. Prior to the NGO, the cardiologist sat down with me and explained the procedure. And again, he was as confident as I was that nothing would be amiss. Um, halfway through the procedure, the medical staff began rushing around and talking in hushed tones, which was very confusing and a bit scary for me. After some time, the cardiologist crouched down and explained to me that there was something going on my, with my heart um, that, they, that has completely surprised them and they're not 100% sure what was going on. And that we had three options. Uh, we could stent what looks like a spasm in my heart, open me up or do nothing and seek guidance from colleagues in Sydney. Thankfully, they decided to seek guidance. I remember lying on the bed with um, the, the, the wire running through me and I was crying, thinking, but I can't have something wrong with me. I'm breastfeeding a baby. I can't have something wrong with me. And this beautiful nurse was dabbing my eyes with a tissue. I'll never forget her kindness. A day later, the cardiologist handed me a sticky note with SCAD written on it, that I could Google it and that I was his first patient who had had a SCAD and that he didn't really know much about it. That put the fear of God into me. He was extremely knowledgeable and experienced in traditional heart attacks. Um, and I was terrified by the limited information and the lack of research, not only in SCAD, but into women who have had heart attacks. And that's what started the fire in my belly. Men are well represented in heart disease research, as we all know, and it was glaringly obvious to me at the time that women were not. Our symptoms were different to men. Uh, and for the layperson like myself, with little medical education, my introduction to heart attacks were in the movies when you, you see a, an older, unhealthy man clutching his chest and, you know, crying in pain um, and dropping to the ground. Uh, mine wasn't nearly that dramatic, but my education in heart attacks was just beginning. I was popped on traditional heart attack medication, blood thinners, beta blockers, um, BP meds, even though I had, didn't have any high blood pressure or anything like that. Um, again, this medication had been thoroughly researched for, um, with male patients. The impacts of the medication as a young woman were quite tough. Um, the fatigue was horrendous, particularly when I was running around after two little kids. Um, I would bruise extremely easy and my periods were extremely heavy. Um, I basically looked and I felt like a delight. I was hoped that it was hoped that the medication would prevent further heart attacks. It didn't. I, um, cardiac rehab wasn't recommended for me after my first SCAD. Uh, because it's not a traditional heart attack, I didn't need to learn um, to change my lifestyle because I was already healthy. Um, and I didn't need to you know, learn how to eat well or anything, exercise, those sorts of things. But upon reflection, and gathering further information, rehab. What rehab does do is provide a safe environment to exercise with medical professionals monitoring you. Big part of the recovery of SCAD is trusting your body again and gaining confidence in your capabilities and not fearing of being broken all of a sudden again, out of the blue. Four years later, in 2020, in the middle of COVID, I had another SCAD, this time at work. My symptoms were a little bit different, although I still had the discomfort down my arm um, and the extreme nauseous feeling. This time though, I had pain in my back and also in my jaw. When it happened, I was in denial. I thought, no, this, this, I didn't even think. And my colleague said to me, Jen, you look sick. And I said, I don't feel well. And I was telling her about my symptoms. And she said, do you think you might be having another heart attack? And I went, oh, my stomach dropped because 
I knew that that's probably what had happened and I didn't realise it even though I was educated by this time in heart attacks. So again, I didn't call an ambulance. Um, this time, um, I, it was in the middle of COVID and the medical system was struggling and I didn't want to put anybody out. Um, when I got to hospital, majority of the hospital staff were extremely caring um, and understanding. However, I did overhear one of the nurse um, nurses in, tell the transport team in handover that, oh, she thinks she's had another heart attack. I think it's just a panic attack. This really triggered the self-advocate in me. Um, I'm a social worker by trade and so advocacy is part of my bread and butter. But we generally do this for our clients, not for ourselves. I knew I wasn't well and I consciously gave myself permission to fight for my health. I was struggling with the fact that I'd had more than one heart attack and that this would mean it's open slather. How many more would I have? Would it kill me? Would my boys be, mother boys be motherless? I again had another heart attack in 2022. Now you'd think by this stage that I'd be educated in heart attacks and I would pick that I'd had yet another one. Um, again, symptoms were a little bit different. Same discomfort down here and nauseous, but the pain was radiating in more in the right side of my chest because apparently the tear was in the right side of the heart. Um, so it did present a little bit different. Um, so I, I didn't call the ambulance again. Um, again, it was in COVID times and I felt like I was wasting resource. And I've since been read the right act by my cardiologist and all my family and friends. <laughs> but next, there's not that there's going to be a next time. But if there is, I will be calling an ambulance. Um, so this time I waited in a long line in ED um, that was out the door. And after about 30 minutes, a nurse asked, was walking along the line and asked if anyone had chest pain or discomfort. I burst into tears and spoke up and I was feeling terribly sick by this stage and I could barely stand up. So at that point, the red carpet was rolled out. They remembered me from last time and I'm officially now a frequent flyer and an overachiever in this um, aspect. Uh, but my recovery journey has been quite an emotional one. After the, my next two heart attacks, the medical team, including rehab and psychologists and cardiologists, really helped to reframe uh, the fact that my body didn't try to kill me three times, it actually tried to save me and the confidence in my body grew from there. I currently have an excellent cardiologist who remains up to date on the latest SCAD information, but most importantly, he listens to me and he validates the continued emotional journey I'm on and has never ever disregarded my emotional well-being. Um, however, I'm very aware that we don't have enough research into conditions like SCAD. There's not enough female representation in studies. We don't know the cause. We don't have a gold standard of treatment. What meds work the best? We don't know how to prevent it. As you know, there is still gender bias in heart research, including treatment. And quite simply, in order to improve health, health, health outcomes for all, we need to consider gender and sex in health and medical research. Disregarding someone who doesn't look like a heart patient causes delays in treatment and proves extremely detrimental. As I've been jotting down some notes for today's launch, I've come to the realisation that as women, we often put ourselves last. It's embedded in us. We don't advocate, advocate for ourselves like we do for our children, our partners, our friends, our clients. We don't want to be a burden on society. We're pulled in every direction, but we need to start utilising the resources that are there for us call the ambulance, speak up if you don't feel heard, speak up if you're not well, it could save your life. As you can tell from my story, I have a fire in my belly, fire in my belly regarding dispelling the myths that heart attacks don't happen to women. And that's why I'm really excited about the centre launch, which I have no doubt, no doubt will have a tremendous impact on the health, health outcomes for many, particularly those who are underrepresented. Thank you for allowing me to share my journey. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Jen, for um, telling us your story. It was amazing and inspirational and gives us a purpose, I think, as, as a group. Thank you so much. Um, 
So for the final presentation of this morning's session, I told you uh, in my opening remarks that we were very fortunate to be able to learn from the best. And uh, because Australia has been a bit lagging behind in this environment of achieving sex and gender equity in health and medical research, I am positive that we can learn from people who have done it before and accelerate the whole process for us so it doesn't take us another 20 years. And this is exactly why uh, we are grateful and lucky to have Professor Kara Tannenbaum with us. So again, very long bio that you are welcome to read in the booklet, but Kara is from Canada and she's a professor of medicine at the Uni Université de Montréal. And she's an internationally recognized, not only researcher, but also geriatrician and women's health specialist. She served at the scientific, as the scientific director of the Institute of General Health at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research from 2015 to 2022. And she is also the one who launched Canada's National Women's Health Initiative. I'm sure we will hear much more about her journey now. Thank you, Cara, for being with us. What a moment. Um, is everyone as excited and feeling emotional like I am? Can I just put that out there? Uh, Jen, thank you for sharing your story. And um, I feel really, really fortunate to be here with you today. Really fortunate to be welcomed on the Bedigo territory um, and to be at the start of what I think will be a movement here in Australia. The, the center may be a virtual convening hub, but you're all the energy that's going to make this change happen. And we're going to do it for folks like Jen so that Jen, you don't have another heart attack, and more importantly, um, the faces yet to come don't have a heart attack, and the faces yet to come is an expression that I learned from Alex McComer, who's a um, Ghanaian Kahaga elder, a First Nations elder in Montreal when we launched the Indigenous Gender and Wellness Initiative in 2017. But it's Australia's turn to be brave and bold right now in what you want to achieve. What's really fun for me standing here, and I think what's going to be fun for you, is that you're not the first um, to start a center for sex and gender equity in health and medicine, um, but you are definitely in the world's top 10. And that positions you to learn from everyone's others' successes and, you know, course corrections, but also to bring your own flavor and energy to what you want to create, what you want to advance, and be the change that you want to see, I guess. Um, so I was invited here, I think, to share a little bit about what's worked, as well as some of the mistakes that we made in Canada. Um, you know, with humility, it doesn't always go well the first time, I think, and that's normal, and that's going to be one of the lessons learned that I share with you, but having resilience and bouncing back and keeping that hope and, and, you know, persevering is what ultimately determines success more than the quality of the idea in the first place. And we know that from science. We know that from a lot of different areas. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you what we've accomplished, hopefully to inspire you, but also to encourage your reflections on the center strategy going forward. Now, a little bit of background for those of you who don't know. Uh, Canada has a national health research funding organization, like I think what you call Australia's NHMRC, is that correct? Thank you. Oh, I love that you're all telling me good. Uh, keep on nodding and kind of coming along with me here. Uh, and the way we do it in Canada is that uh, taxpayer money, because quite frankly, we have a public system too, some of you mentioned, uh, is dedicated and invested in science. And in health science, we have 13 different institutes, kind of like the NIH model. I don't think that's your model here. No, everyone's saying no. But we have an Institute of Gender and Health as one of these institutes that's able to shape funding and policy and practice. So our center was established in 2000. 
So we have 25 years of experience. It was quite visionary. It wasn't easy just between us here. You know, what's said in the room stays in the room. It turns out there was actually a lot of back and forth about whether there even should be a center, uh, an institute we call it, on gender and health. There was advocacy by the women's group to have it a women's health initiative, uh, women's health um, center, but of course it wasn't women making the decision, so they took it off the table, they put it back on the table. Finally somebody said, well I guess it's important, but let's call it gender and health because it can't just be about women. And in retrospect, that was the right decision. A hundred percent that was the right decision, and I'm going to tell you why. Was that applause? Well, Can Canada is visionary for sure. So of course, and again, what's said in this room stays in this room because we did talk a little bit about unintentional consequences of our actions as well as intentional consequences of our actions. And yes, maybe we need to take, what is it, two, step, two steps forward to be pushed back one step in order to move forward. Maybe that's just the way the world works, but it would be better if you could just take the two step forward and then take another two steps forward, right? So what happened was that I was the third scientific director of the Institute of Gender and Health in Canada. And the first scientific director, Miriam Stewart, said, doesn't matter that it's called the Institute of Gender and Health. This is going to be about women's health, and we are going to invest our money in women's health. And she did a fabulous job. She invested in gender violence. She invested in some of the biases in the healthcare system. And what do you think happened over the next eight years as she completed her mandate? Can anyone guess? Well, there was pushback. Um, they said, I thought this was supposed to be the Institute of Gender and Health. How come we're not investing in men's health? How come we're not investing in sexual and gender minority health? How come it was decided to be called the Institute of Gender and Health, but we've only invested in women? And uh, the powers that be that make decisions about where the government's money go to, goes to said, yeah, like, how come? And so then the second scientific director came on, and her name was Joy Johnson, and she's also just absolutely amazing. And she uh, was a member and a strong advocate for the LGBT community in Canada, but she was tasked with advancing boys' and men's health because it wasn't fair that just women's health was being advanced. So she launched a boys' and men's health program that also has been very successful, which I don't have time to tell you about today, but, um, you know, toxic masculinity, mental health issues in men, men complete suicide more often, um, we don't have all the answers, uh, you know, men die earlier than women, um, a lot of men from uh, the LGBT community, a lot of stigma around seeking health care, like there's issues, for sure there's issues. And she also did what I think was um, critical, which is she educated people what the term sex and gender meant. And that was really, really important. Sex is biological factors that impact your health, like genes and hormones, and I think you know this, and anatomy and, and physiology. And gender, she was the first one who said, well, don't just think gender identity when you hear gender, which is how a person you know, self-perceives as whether uh, the way they feel in their own skin matches the sex that they were assigned at birth. But what about gender roles? What about gender relations, gender violence? What about institutionalized gender? All these things play a role for everyone across the sex and gender spectrum. And I think that that was transformative, just making sure that the language that we used was well understood by everyone. So then, I came on as the third scientific director of the Institute, and I look back at the history, and you say, okay, where do we go next? So where would you have gone next? What's that? Uh, bring it together? Yes, bring it together. Um, but I also looked around and realized that a lot of this was happening in a bit of an echo chamber, an echo chamber of those who were passionate and cared about sex, gender, you know, women's health, men's health, LGBT health, sexual gender minority health. We weren't even talking about indigenous. Well, we, start, we were starting to talk about indigenous health and racialized minorities and intersectionality, but not that much. And I said, how are we gonna change culture? 
how are we going to change the world if we haven't brought the other 90 to 95% of people who aren't thinking about this along with us? And so being from a biomedical background, one of the commitments that I made in, in our strategic plan was, so our strategic plan was a little, well, you could think about it because you have to make your strategic plan for the center, but um, we decided the three I's to integrate sex and gender across all the different stakeholder groups, then to innovate within sex and gender science, which is a term that we ended up coining, and then to, um, uh, to have impact in, in translating what we learned into practice and policy. So how do you integrate sex and gender into the research, for instance, that everyone was doing? Because I was tasked with science and health research. Um, and that is something that we really had to think about. I can tell you that, you know, we went from only 15% of folks integrating sex and gender in biomedical, clinical, uh, health system research and public health research at a start to now 90% of researchers in Canada um, are self-reporting that they're doing this. So how did we get there? Um, what are some of the lessons learned? Um, we also, so that's what we did, maybe that was one of our priorities. We also decided that we needed to launch uh, LGBT community-led research through an intersectional lens. That was something that we wanted to do, but there were challenges there too because there wasn't a lot of trust and there was a lot of intimidation applying for these really, really big grants when a lot of the community-led support was at the community level. And so we actually had to rethink, you know, how do we make this open and welcoming for everyone? Maybe we should make it a first grant if you've never applied, if you don't have a research background, but you want to evaluate what you're doing so that you have some data. Um, you could choose, do you want $5,000? Do you want $10,000? Do you want to apply for the $250,000 grants? So just making it more accessible, I think, to folks who haven't gone through that ivory tower of letter and letter and letter after your name, which hasn't been easy for everyone because of where they come from, I think was really important in terms of lowering the barriers to access. We also launched an Indigenous Gender and Wellness Initiative. And here, with, with great humility, you know, I stood up and said um, at an Indigenous gathering, uh, and some of you have heard this story, you know, I really think that sex and gender is going to be important for, you know, indigenous communities in Canada to think about. There's, there are some poor health outcomes and we want to change that. So, you know, think about sex and gender. And I was fortunate that there was a brave young scholar, indigenous scholar in the room who stood up in front of like a thousand people in all the different nations, including the heads of government and said, with all due respect, are you trying to recolonize us? Um, do you know that there's no words for sex and gender in our language? Isn't sex sort of that binary concept that was imposed on us by the church? And you're telling us what we need to make our community healthy? Like, please go home. Um, but sometimes that's what it takes because I was standing in ignorance and I did have bias, but what's important is you go through your journey with the center is to make sure that you listen. And that was a real wake up call. It didn't, didn't stop us from saying, okay, uh, this is too intimidating, scary, uncomfortable. We said, this obviously needs to be indigenous led. Um, let's put together an indigenous steering committee. Let's find out, uh, there are no words. So we made a visual for indigenous gender and wellness and we hosted uh, what was recommended to us by elders as an ideas fair and learning circle. Um, and this, this went forward and actually has had a lot of success. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Uh, in retrospect, I probably should have engaged earlier, but hey, you know, what is it that uh, they say? You can't learn if you don't make mistakes, because if you knew it in the first place, then you probably can't learn more. So are there going to be um, different challenges that you're going to be asked to rise up to? Absolutely. So what lessons can I share with you from this journey uh, for Australia? Lesson number one, the center is here to help everyone. And I love that because you don't have to choose. 
as a medical doctor, I'd be really sad, like, if I was head of one of the institutes of, let's say, just, I don't know, bones and connective tissue. Because what about the heart? What about, you know, what about the brain? What about, uh, you mentioned emotional health. Um, but this center doesn't have to choose. You can call everybody in, and you have the possibility to do anything. That's amazing. I mean, women need attention. We heard that from Jen. Um, women are not just small men. I like to say that, as we heard uh, medical research was founded on men, and we shouldn't assume. So we need to get rid of the gender bias in the healthcare system. We could help women. But men also need attention, absolutely, especially in the mental health sphere, especially with some of the societal norms that are expected of men. Things are changing, but if what you say is true, Padma, then the stereotypes here are still alive and well. I think, for what's expected from masculinity uh, in terms of being a breadwinner and having strength and courage and, and everything. So I think men need help. Sexual and gender and racialized minorities have been forced to be advocates for themselves because nobody else was advocating for them. And now it's a moment where the center can stand by and support and make sure that there's equitable health care delivered to everyone. Um, and indigenous folk, uh, you know, as I told you, they have much to teach us. If only we can get past our privilege um, and listen with humility. So this is exciting. Um, it's very exciting. There's room for everyone. Don't call anyone out. Call everybody in. There will be windows of opportunity where one, I don't want to call it a cause, I don't want to call it a group, but where one, I don't know, just strategic, thought advances more than the other, because that's the way government works, that's the way society works, that's the way the media works, but it doesn't mean that there won't be another opportunity for folks to advance. And instead of going against each other and competing, can we cheer on all the groups for whom we're going to be able to make progress? Um, you know, luck is opportunity plus preparation, they say, and so be prepared when the opportunity will come for a different, um, I guess, dream to come true more than another. So that's lesson number one. You're here to help everyone. Lesson number two, you can have impact. And I think that you could change the world. I think that, like I said, we drove the proportion of researchers in Canada who were accounting for sex and gender in their research up from 15% to 90%. And there are times when it's not applicable, absolutely. Uh, by the way, um, it's getting harder and harder to find times when it's not applicable, but there are still a tiny few. Was it easy? No. Did we persevere? No. What was our magic bullet? Well, there is no magic bullet. That is the magic bullet. It's a requires a complicated, multi-pronged approach. In Canada, it started with a policy. Um, we heard earlier from Padma that there's going to be what we call the sex and gender-based analysis policy. In Canada, we have gender-based budgeting. Every single form that goes up to government to make a policy decision does have a sex and gender-based analysis box where you have to talk about the intentional and unintentional consequences on different groups of people for the policy. So we've had that in place for a while. What's wonderful about a policy is that it does allow you to audit the policy, so there's actually accountability. It also makes it easier for you to refer to the policy when um, you're trying to put initiatives in place. So I think having a policy is one component. It doesn't need to be necessary, but it was very helpful to us. Reporting, there's no management without good measurement. So how are we measuring? What are we measuring? How can you show progress if you're not measuring? In Canada, we actually have what people call the sex and gender box, where you actually have to check off if sex is accounted for in your research or if gender is accounted for in your research. But we learned if you just say no and that's all that we ask you to do, then people just say no. So we had to justify why. Now, I think the European Commission and the UK and others have moved to you have to do it by default and justify why you're not doing it. But again, when I came on as head of the institute, uh, I think there were 5,000 people in the cancer uh, conference. And again, a young scholar, so young people in the audience, 
like let your voice be heard, amplify your voice. He said, excuse me, we've been filling out that stupid box for like five years now and I have never gotten a comment back from an evaluator if they like what I wrote or not. Is anyone reading it? So that was also another wake up call, right? So we said, well, we need folks to evaluate and to give feedback. There has to be accountability for the initiatives that we're trying to put in place. So we needed to educate, uh, we developed tools, but again, it doesn't matter how many tools you have if people aren't motivated to use them. So we did make training modules, but then we had to figure out how to get folks to use them. And that was another journey. It was a journey where we invited people in, and this was a critical decision. I think you're gonna have to decide, because I'm talking to you as if you are gonna be the life force of the center because you're here so you care, but you're gonna have to decide, um, do you want to stand there and say, sex and gender is important, come here, be part of us, uh, you need to join us, this is important. So that's, and some people think that's the way to do it. Um, or do you just wanna, or and, and or, I should say and or, because I think we ended up doing both. Do you wanna go to where people are? Do you wanna piggyback on them? I mentioned to you in the example that I went to the indigenous conference. I went to the cancer conference. I didn't just hold a sex and gender conference and expect everyone to come in, right? So going to where people are, instead of also inviting them to be part of you, I think is very reasonable and will allow you to reach more people. And that's one of the critical lessons I think that we learn. So be prepared to travel, to be jet lagged, but go to where they are. I think that that's very important. So what are some of the things that we did? For universities, everyone has a research day in the different faculties, right? So we actually contacted like every single faculty and said, do you have a research day? Can we offer a prize for the best poster that integrates sex and gender throughout Canada? Um, and they said, sure, but are you gonna come evaluate that? And sometimes we did and sometimes we couldn't because there's a lot of research days. So we said, well, here's sort of the sheet where the poster judges would just have to check the criteria and then we trust you. You can decide what's best based on these criteria and you could give out the little prize. And so what did we do there? We recognized the work of the students, but we also taught, the, I think, the judges the kind of questions that they should be asking. Um, we invited folks who had just got their first grant to come meet us and tell us about their first grant. Now, do you think most of them were taking sex and gender into account? No, but we wanted to hear about their research. We told them there was a lot of people coming. They could only have three slides. The first slide should be about their research. The second slide should be about the challenges that they could ask us for advice. And the third slide, can you just mention like how sex and gender might be relevant to, to what you're doing? And they all showed up. And what do you think they said when they got to the sex and gender slide? At least half of them like, were honest and said, I gotta be honest, hadn't really thought about this and it wasn't really in my proposal, but because you asked me to make the slide, I had to kind of do some research and it's actually really important and here's why and now I think I'm gonna change what I'm doing because you know this is good science, this is good medicine, this is gonna help a lot of people. But we invited them in um, and we worked maybe through ego and fear, like what are the two basic human motivators, right? Like you wanna look good when you make this presentation um, and you don't wanna look bad. So, so I think when it comes right down to it, how are you going to change behavior is something that is almost just as important as educating about the importance of sex and gender. So um, I think that what we also did was, in terms of accountability, we did eventually, and it took a while, ask the evaluators on grants to indicate whether the integration of sex and, and or gender was a strength, a weakness, or not applicable to the application. And then what do you think happened with those evaluators on the 58 different peer review committees who were evaluating the grants? What do you think went through their mind? Well, I'm gonna have to like write something smart about this, right? And I'm gonna have to defend my rating in front of my peers. So Albert Bandura, social learning theory and peer comparison, that could be a really big motivator for change. And so these ideas of behavior change are very important. You could put in place structures and processes, but don't forget the people and what's gonna get them on board. 
if it's business, is it going to be uh, financial? If it's universities, is it going to be their reputation? If it's researchers, is it going to be ego or fear? If it's patients, is it thinking about your kids or your loved ones? I mean, what motivates people? Because everyone has so many competing priorities and things that are important these days that finding the right thing to get their energy dedicated to what we want to accomplish is not a small feat and is going to take a little bit of very smart thinking. So there. So that's lesson number two. You can have impact. You can change the world. Um, but it's not just going to be about the tools and expecting people to come to you because they see it's the right thing to do. So my third and final lesson is that science evolves. And so must you. And so much the sense, so will the center. Uh, so many things have changed in the world in the last few years. So be prepared to be nimble. Be prepared to pivot. Uh, you're going to want to simultaneously disseminate the best practices um, while also growing the science. And maybe also wondering where Australia can be first in the world. Um, I am very proud. I think that Canada is first in the world in integrating sex and gender into our research. Um, we have the numbers to prove it. It took 25 years. We have the numbers to prove it, though. Um, you, yes, you need to catch up, absolutely. Do you know what proportion of researchers across your country are integrating sex and gender? So you have some catching up to do, like you said, Severine. But where do you want to lead? There's so many places to lead. Um, maybe it's women's health. Maybe it's men's health. Maybe it's LGBT health through an intersectional lens. Maybe it's the way indigenous gender and wellness come together. Maybe, I mean, the sky's the limit, right? There are, maybe it's at the university level. Maybe it's in the healthcare provider level. I don't know any country that has clinical care algorithms that are slightly different and tailored to sex and gender. Um, there is so much opportunity here. So I'm going to invite you to distinguish yourself. And I'm going to invite you to be the leaders that other people follow. If they don't have to, right? That's what being a good leader is. It's if people follow you. Um, I think that it's an exciting time. Today and going forward, you get to define Australia's fate um, and Australia's leadership with the center in sex and gender. I'm standing here today because I had a dream I had a dream that we really could integrate it into sex and gender. It was a rocky road. Um, there were some unintentional consequences, and we had to course correct. But I'm here so that you could be inspired that your dream could come true. So keep that dream in your head as we go through the day today and going forward, because I believe that your dream can come true, too. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you so much, Kara. So that was no less than I expected. And I can't wait for you, what is it, to spend the 18 months of your 12 month sabbatical in Australia? Uh, yeah, we, we would love to have you back. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask another round of applause for our three wonderful, strong women who talked this morning in this session <laughs> and provided us with such um, varied and important view of a same issue that we're here to try and solve together.